Hi, I'm Ashley Withers. I'm here with Can Do. I am the creative strategist here on the marketing team. And I am speaking with Daniel Quick of Thought Industries. And Daniel, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Daniel Quick. I'm VP of Learning Strategies at Thought Industries. And super happy to be here. Yeah, I, today we're going to talk about um, not even just your um, role as a customer with um, Can Do, but also just how content plays a role in you know the learning experience for you all at Thought Industries and what the difference is kind of between content and a content experience. Um, and so how we can talk about the role of dashboards or you know product-led growth kind of in that um, in that realm. So I'm going to go ahead and start, um, let's see. So just a little bit of background at you, about you. Actually, I just wanna start with, you know, kind of um, who you are at Thought Industries and kind of how long you've been there, as well as what Thought Industries is and, and for our audience who doesn't know. Yeah, great. So, I actually got my start about 20 years ago, uh, working in the dot-com uh, industry, developing online communities back when online communities were um, kind of a new hot thing. So I worked for this brand called Global English, which was all about teaching English to people around the world and how we could use community to connect students to each other and to teachers uh, to help them learn English. Um, and after I did that for a little bit, um, in other words, after the dot-com bust, I went back to school, uh, studied educational psychology, and really took an interest in what games could teach us about learning. And then I became a game designer and started a company with my twin brother um, here in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And after selling that company, uh, I really wanted to return to the world of learning and was really thrilled to discover customer education where learning meets technology, because I've always been a big tech geek. So uh, I joined Optimizely um, to build and lead their academy and certification program. And from there, I took a job at Asana as head of customer education, and then moved to Thought Industries about a year and a half ago as their VP of uh, learning strategies. And as VP of learning strategies, my role is to really lead our customer learning center of excellence. So. My function has two teams. One is focused on conducting research and developing content around best practices, strategy, thought leadership, and um, that content can then inform the practice of customer education. And the other team uh, on learning strategies are the practitioners, uh, our own customer education team, where we're really hoping to build a, a gold standard customer education program. Um, thought Industries, for anyone who doesn't know, is a customer learning management system, a platform to deliver um, customer education and, and professional training uh, to um, the external market, to anyone who wants to, um, to learn something. And so it's really built from the ground up to uh, ensure that the learning experience is engaging and um, optimized for all sorts of things that people care about in that world, um, uh, like potentially monetization, connecting uh, to other systems, et cetera. So that's what Thought Industries is really all about. And <clears throat> you wanted to know a little bit more about my uh, how how my background in video game design influences my work at Thought Industries. Yeah, I think yeah. that's something people are going to really find interesting because, I mean, uh, immediately that stood out to me just looking at your background. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really, really fun journey. Um, I'm a big gamer, and so being a game designer was kind of a dream. Um, but I think to answer this question on the screen here, I think it's important to first define what a game is. So yeah. a game is a system uh, defined by rules in which players are, are challenged to achieve a goal. So if you accept that definition of what a game is, then a game designer's job at its core is to create those systems. Um, and those are systems that motivate players to achieve that goal. So in other words, video game design at its core is all about motivation. Games aren't games unless they're played. 
And so the key to good game design is to create experiences that, that motivate uh, your players to participate in the game. And this requires game designers to have a really deep understanding of the psychology of motivation and how to use techniques that tap into our motivational drives like storytelling and competition and status and rewards. So <clears throat> what I learned as a game designer is the importance of motivation, which is actually a really key ingredient to good learning. Uh, as a game designer, I'm always asking, how do I get my players to continue playing? And as a learning strategist at Thought Industries, I'm actually asking a very similar question. How do I get my learners to continue learning? Um, and a key ingredient to that deep learning is motivation. I think, you know, we can all relate to this. We've all taken a, a, a really uh, super boring class or training um, where we had to learn something. And for whatever reason, the person training us thought all they had to do was just kind of dump whatever there was ever is in their head out to us. And oh boy, we just learn it just like that. Yeah. Um, and it's painful. Um, and it's not really how learning works either. Um, it's really difficult to learn something when you're not motivated. Um, and research shows that even if you did manage to learn something, if you're not motivated, you don't have any sort of stimulation, um, then you're probably gonna forget what you learned pretty quickly. So yeah, so for me, it's important to be mindful of designing a learning experience that motivates and dare I say, even delights its learners. And that's what I really um, took with me from the video game industry. Yeah, I well, yeah, I imagine too, when thinking about like content versus a content experience. So there is that aspect of, you know, the the design of the characters or the design itself, like that's sort of the content, but that experiential component is just, it's really fascinating how you've translated that into the learning experience. And it kind of makes me think about how we have terms like gamification gamification <laughs> i don't know how you say it specifically but gamification, yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so i think um the motivation aspect of that is is definitely plays a role and um yeah i think when we think about those design challenges um is there anything i'm trying to think you know if we covered this just before but at, that when you were a game designer um, did you have challenges that you feel like kind of prepared you? So maybe this looks like, yeah. you know, what motivation um, or what were some examples of that maybe? Yeah, well, one of the first things that come to mind is um, actually as a game designer, it's um, very related to learning. Uh, I created uh, tutorials for the games that uh, we published. So you had, you know, you start a game and um, you often begin with a tutorial to help you understand the mechanics of the game. Uh, which is, you know, a learning experience. <laughs> so yeah. it's actually a super interesting and challenging experience to design because good tutorials require an understanding of learning science. A, a good game tutorial is often, um, a, very often, a, a great example of scaffolding, um, which is this term where you're moving learners from, um, you know, progressively through an ex uh, a learning experience in a way that builds on previously acquired skills and knowledge. Similarly, when you play a game and there's a great tutorial, you're moving through the level um, and mechanics are introduced in a way um, that's sort of like building on what you've already learned in a way that's really avoiding um, overwhelming you or inducing too much cognitive load. And I, I really loved creating tutorials um, and I think I was pretty good at it. And, and that's partly because of my background in learning science. So in a way, my experience as a learning designer helped me as a game designer and my experience as a game designer helped me as a learning designer. And there's definitely quite a bit of reciprocity. There are a lot of overlap. Yeah, well, I have a slight curve Ball for you, but I, it makes me think when you say tutorials of those sort of like non playable characters. And I wonder if, you know, with the non playable character, that there's some sort of like kind of humanization of maybe that yeah. tutorial. And so I wonder if when you think about a content experience for thought industries, it's like, how do you create a scalable experience while also making it feel? human um, as you're providing the tutorial. And maybe we don't have to answer that right now, but it's just something to think about. I find that really fascinating. Yeah. So 
So your your question is about how to make the content experience feel more relatable, more. Yeah, like when you're building a tutorial, were, were there yeah. certain things that you would think about in terms of making it feel um, more human and in a way that would motivate people um, to complete certain tasks? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, when we created tutorials, there was, uh, you're right, you're spot on, there was usually a, a non-player character um, that shows up right away and they need your help. Um, in one game, they actually fought you first. And, that, and <laughs> through that fight, they kind of taught you how to fight. Okay. Um, but it, it was a really, it, it, in, in every tutorial I've designed, there is always this um, non-player character who is kind of your guide um, and teaches you the mechanics of the game. And, um, and you know, I think to your point, what, what we're doing in that is what we're doing by, by having a non-player character rather than just kind of some disembodied tooltip or whatnot, you're immersing the, um, the player into the story. You're really connecting them to the theme. Um, you're using storytelling. Um, it's a really great way to evoke emotion and um, help you feel um, like this is, uh, you know, part of a, a story. You're, you're not just kind of learning the mechanics of a game. You're actually practicing your skills as a character in the game, um, trying to achieve a goal. So, you know, I think um, in, in similar ways, when we design content experiences, um, a question that we often want to ask is how can the the learner um, connect to the content in a way that feels uh, meaningful, that they are that they relate to the content, that there is some sort of emotional stimulation, that they're immersed in the content. And there's definitely techniques that you can use for that, um, storytelling techniques, um, themes, um, humans, people who are talking. You know, I have this kind of anecdote that I often share about how when I, uh, was working at Optimizely and we were trying to drive more engagement with our academy courses. One of the things that we did um, was just put a little talking head at the beginning of every course. Um, just yeah. someone talks for a minute about what this course is all about. Um, and that's all we did. And we saw um, a lot higher engagement with courses because there was sort of this human element. It, it helped people connect to the course. It helped them really understand what's in it for them. Um, and, you know, that's something that uh, definitely is um, related to game design and that you're really looking for ways to uh, connect the player or the learner to the experience in a way that feels emotional. I love that. It does really feel like a more engaging experience when there's that human aspect. Yeah. And yeah, so I, I think when we think about these things, there's the idea of like user experience and user interface. And so we have that we've covered kind of a little bit of that with um, video game design. So um, I think we've pretty much covered, you know, how game thinking and design thinking kind of go hand in hand. Um, is there anything else that you would add to that? Or um, do you feel like hmm. we've covered that? Well, um... You know, again, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, game design is about motivation, about stimulating your, your players to continue playing the game. Uh, in video games, any friction you experience with the UX or the UI um, is going to cause you to lose motivation. I actually can't tell you how many times I've played a game um, and then gave up pretty quickly, not because I felt the mechanics were, were poor or the story was poor, but because of poorly designed user interfaces, um, especially it feels like in mobile gaming, especially a lot of times I'll, you know, load up a mobile game and the menus are all over the place. And it's just like, there's all this stimulation. It just feels kind of overwhelming. Um, so I think this is another area, area where um, uh, game designers could benefit more from the from some mastery of learning science because as a learning professional I know that too much stimulation too many choices for example can overwhelm the player um, or overwhelm the learner and this is something that I think a lot of game designers don't really understand so in my role at thought industries I, I think a lot about user experience um, in learning because I know that a poor user experience completely disrupts the learning process. It's, 
is very similar to a, a well-designed video game. A, a good learning experience like, like a video game is grounded in intuitive, human-centered user experience. Um, and I think that both in designing video games and design learning experiences, you can really benefit from design thinking because the goal of design thinking is to tackle a problem. In this case, um, the intrusion of menus and interfaces. How do you sort of disrupt whatever someone's doing by providing menus? Um, to do that in a way that's iterative and, and deeply empathic with the end user or the player or the learner. So that's a common challenge for both SaaS products and um, complex games. How do you surface all the things you can do in a way that uh, is minimizes friction and facilitate facilitates adoption? So yeah. Yeah, and actually I'm thinking about like really complex video games where uh, the learning curve is really high. The mechanics are introduced one at a time over a fairly decent length of time. Um, and some, in fact, some of my, my favorite games actually lock features. Like you can't do things in a game until you gain experience, maybe you level up, and then you kind of get to learn a new system, a new feature which is a really great way to, to gradually ease yourself into the game and learn things. Um, it's scaffolding. I don't know if you can actually do that with a SaaS product. I mean, is it advisable to lock more advanced features until you've somehow <laughs> demonstrated mastery over more basic features? Um, from a learning perspective, I think it's a great idea, but I think you know, customers who pay for SaaS products generally don't want to be denied access to parts of the product. Um, but Neither is it a good idea to teach customers everything they could possibly do with the product in the first few minutes of using it. Instead, I'd really hold off teaching them how to use a feature until you've received a signal that they're ready to use it. So for example, at Thought Industries, you might hold off teaching the customer about our reporting hub until you have data um, to analyze or until you're really getting a signal that, that they're, they're ready to use the reporting hub and then you teach them about the reporting hub. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think about when we're planning content, parts of like, you know, onboarding and, um, you know, how all of that comes into play within the UI of a SaaS product and, um, yeah, I, I do think it's extremely relatable. And I do think you're right in game design, there is that choice fatigue that's really similar um, that you might experience when you log into a dashboard for the first time. So yeah. And let's see, I do see um, some questions coming in and thank you for that. We will have time for questions at the end. I'm really excited uh, to get to those. And um, so I think part of um, creating a content experience is, um, I guess, your kind of superpowers that you might have as a creative individual. Um, because I assume a lot of a content experience like within game design requires obviously creative thinking. So how can you solve some of these challenges um, that you're coming across in terms of, you know, looking at what is not going to overwhelm the user. Um, are there any times where you feel like your sort of creativity kind of impacted um, your ability to kind of think through some of these problems? Well, I love this um, idea of superpowers that you have in this question. Um, I love the idea of superpowers, period. Um, well, especially, uh, you know, rules for the universe. <laughs> Yeah. Design. What's yeah, your superpower? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually ask um, candidates anytime I interview them what their superpower is. Um, I also ask them what their kryptonite is because every superhero has their kryptonite. So, and I think of kryptonite less as a weakness than something that inhibits the expression of your superpower. So, um, anyway, I'm, I, you know, my superpower, I, I consider myself a, a strong ideator and strategic thinker. I love thinking outside the box. And I've, I've noticed an ability to connect the dots um, between seemingly disparate systems or ideas, which I think sets the stage for new possibilities and innovation. 
And yeah, I mean, I like to think that I see the forest through the trees while also noticing the small details uh, about the bark on this particular tree that might be significant to the bigger picture. So from that angle, my kryptonite then is a lack of transparency. And I've worked in organizations where I didn't feel included in the larger organizational strategic planning, even as I watched my peers invited to participate. I felt as if my leaders didn't really believe customer education was important enough or relevant enough to warrant a seat at the table. And I'm betting that a lot of people in customer education feel similarly. So with that lack of transparency, I really had to actively investigate what other teams were doing in order to use my superpower and connect the dots. Um, but unfortunately, not everyone is really always open to my invitation to collaborate. And so occasionally I was even told to stay in my lane, uh, which is a real shame because you and I were talking about this before the, this, uh, this started, the webinar started, but um, you know, customers are always learning. When you think about the customer journey, there's a learning journey that's laid on top of that from the moment that they become aware of your product, they're Googling something about how can I solve this problem? And, they're, they're learning something about um, how to solve the problem. They're learning about your product. When they're deciding to buy your product, maybe they're demoing it, maybe they're in the trial, they're learning something. Um, when they're onboarding, they're learning. Um, all the way through gaining mastery, becoming champions of your brand, they're always learning. And the goal is really to make sure that they're learning the right things at the right time. There's very, um, at each one of those learning junctures, there's a, a real possibility that they could learn the wrong thing. Um, and so having a learning strategy is about making sure that they learn the right things. And um, so one of the, you know, just to just about this question, like I, I, one of the things I love what I'm doing at Thought Industries is at the, as a, as the VP of learning strategies, I'm on the leadership team, I report to our CEO, and I have an opportunity to contribute to our marketing strategy, our product strategy, sales, professional services, customer support and success, et cetera. And the other leaders at Thought Industries welcome and are even eager to have a partnership with the learning strategies team. And I also try to be as transparent as possible to my own team uh, about what's going on in our organization so that others who share my, my superpower uh, feel encouraged to connect the dots and, and contribute in meaningful ways. Yeah, the, the idea of sort of staying in your lane, I think is so interesting because if you think about it in terms of customer education, it's like um, we have so much to learn from our customers. And if we applied that same logic of staying in your lane to our customers and you know they're not experts on our product, but we still have something to learn from them. So I, I do find that really fascinating about you know, how collaboration can kind of um, change the trajectory of a learning strategy and even collaboration with the customers themselves. Yeah, definitely. So um, what advice would you give, especially as a leader, um, to you know, one of your team members who wasn't really sure what their creative superpower you know, is? Well, I'm a huge proponent of giving feedback. Um, giving feedback, uh, being open to feedback, actively seeking feedback. Uh, and this is feedback I can give myself too. Uh, I can watch a recording of this webinar, for example, and maybe learn something about myself that might help me the next time I'm being interviewed. And feedback doesn't always have to be verbal. Uh, you know, you can deliver a presentation and see eyes glaze over uh, or side conversation starting, and that's feedback um, about maybe your content or your delivery style, um, or you know, your emotions. If if you're doing a task, and um, you know, if I'm if I'm doing something, and then I find myself slipping into flow, and then three hours go by in an instance, that's feedback. Um, in fact, that kind of subjective experience how you feel when you're doing something or when you feel you're becoming energized by a task, that's often the best kind of feedback you can get because it's real and untainted by any biased feedback you might get from others. So the advice I would give to someone who doesn't really know their own creative superpower is to pay more attention to feedback because it's there you just might need to pay more attention to it, or you might um, need to maybe more actively seek it. Um, 
I think a good place to begin is taking a personality test. I love things like Strength Finders or Enneagram because they provide feedback to you based on your responses in a way that feels kind of safe, I think. Um, and you know, the, the, the point really is not to really box yourself, but to uh, elicit a, a deeper understanding of yourself, how you show up in life, how others might experience you. And, and even if you don't agree with what results tell you, um, I think that's even a really great insight. Having an understanding of ourselves requires us to reflect on who we are, but also who we are not. So I think a good place to begin would be something like that. Um, of course, I very, I'm very biased about that. I, I studied psychology and personality theory was one of my favorite things about psychology. So um, I'm always the one who's like, oh, there's this quiz to, <laughs> to what kind of, which Game of Thrones character am I? Like, I'm gonna yeah. go ahead and take this quiz. <laughs> I'm always no, that guy I, taking that. <laughs> I, no, I love that though. And something you said that resonated with me is like the focus type of feedback that you're getting. And um, I heard this, you know, saying recently is like, notice what you pay attention to. So throughout your day, what are the things that are um, motivating you? And what, what are you paying attention to? And, and that type of feedback. So I find that really interesting in a learning context as well. Yeah. Jonathan wants to know what Game of Thrones character. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I remember, if I recall, when I took that test, um, I I got Bran. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is it too late? To Is he do the all-seeing character? <laughs> He's the all-seeing character, and um, he ends up being in Jar. Well, I don't want to do spoilers, so never mind. <laughs> Although, I think, I I think like we would be safe at this day. point. <laughs> <laughs> I think spoilers are okay at this point, huh? Yeah. No, that's great. Um, so let's see. Um, I, I think this is how you would use your um, unique brand of creativity to sort of solve problems. So, and that might even go back to your kryptonite and thinking about how, you know, that plays into uh, solving problems as well. Yeah, it's a great question. Um... So, I mean, I see myself as a partner to each member of my team uh, in, their, in their own efforts to understand their superpowers. And I really like to lean into these strengths to help them shine uh, while also challenging them to get out of their comfort zones. Um, I think it's okay to challenge someone to practice a skill they haven't developed, but I usually try to focus on skills that someone is intrinsically motivated to build. Um, and the one thing I always try to avoid is placing kryptonite landmines. Um, so if, if I know your superpower, for example, is organization and managing projects, I'm going to try my best to avoid being vague about details or requirements, because I know that that kind of ambiguity is kryptonite uh, for a project planner and seriously disruptive to their strength. So I think the other thing that's important to me is uh, to be thinking about the team as a whole and how our superpowers interact. Um, I'm always looking for team dynamics that can lead to outcomes that are, are greater than the sum of the parts. And I, you know, I'm a superhero geek. I'm a D and D player. Um, I know a good team needs a tank. Um, they need a blaster. They need someone to heal or support others. Maybe someone who can control the battlefield. It's all about balance and bringing a diversity of superpowers to the team. Great. I love that. What I'm hearing is that collaboration is so important to you, which is I Usually. think an amazing quality for a leader to have. Um, so let's see, uh, content experiences and for thought industries, if we're talking about content being, you know, perhaps an ebook we were just talking about before, um, that's content. What do we think about that for thought industries as turning certain items into like a content experience, a motivator? Um, and then, you know, how did you take that sort of one step further when you brought in um, what we call the flexible dashboard with can do? Yeah, so we were talking earlier that that good storytelling is really a key differentiator when it, it comes to sharing, you know, plain old content versus creating a content experience. Um, I think that's very true. 
Um, when I think about good storytelling, I think about how the story connects to the audience. Um, and in, in a way that creates meaning, as we talked about. Uh, in it, at Thought Industries, when our, when our customers think about our product, we don't really want them to just think about features in a way that is devoid of meaning. We don't want them to, to you know, to know that we have this reporting hub that delivers analytics, boom, that's it. Um, that's what it does. That's its function. What you, what we want you to know is that we understand the importance of measuring results. We know how difficult that can be, and we've developed tools that we think can really help you more easily demonstrate the impact of what you do. Um, and we call this tool the reporting hub. So the value proposition has always really been front of mind for us, um, not just in marketing, but everything we do. We're committed to deeply empathizing with the problems our customers are trying to solve and, and partnering with them on solving those problems. And our product roadmap reflects this commitment, but so does our content. You know, my team, the Learning Strategies team is all about research and content that helps our customers excel at what they do. So. <clears throat> While this commitment to our customers' craft has always existed at Thought Industries, it was very difficult for us to marry the product experience with the content experience. You know, our content uh, lived on our website or in our academy. Um, and it's rich content that can really help you maximize the value you get from using our product. And yet it was siloed away from the product itself where customers could most benefit from it. So can do in the flexible dashboard really allowed us to uh, package this content and fold it into the product. Um, you know, we're able to promote uh, and show a course that we created and to really promote um, why you should take this course or maybe highlight an article we wrote, um, surface a webinar we think will really help you do your job right there in the product. Um, so I think that's the key value proposition of can do for us is that we were able to merge the content experience with the product experience. And that's been a differentiator for us. I love that. So I have, I've mentioned this to you, but pretty much since I've started, uh, you, your uh, face has sort of been um, all over our website in terms of testimonials. And one quote that you have that really stood out to me was that um, the dashboard was sort of a colorful magazine-like um, you know, element within your product. And I just want to know sort of yeah. wh why was that important to you? What does that mean to you? Um, because to me, it just sounds magical. And as you've said before, delightful is like sort of the experience that you're trying to create. Yeah. Um, well, when I first started at Thought Industries, the, um, the admin page, which is the page you sign into when you first sign into our product, um, it was static. Um, there was a welcome message you know, some branding, um, but that's about it. And it's the same thing you saw every time you logged into the product. And the product team and I discussed how we might better utilize that space, given it's the page that everyone sees when they sign into the platform. And uh, we ultimately, we, you know, we decided that we wanted it to feel more dynamic. Um, we, and we wanted it to merge the content experience that we have um, invested in at Thought Industries with the product experience and surface helpful and relevant information. And um, we know we wanted to design a compelling and, and maybe even an emotional experience. Um, and for that, we needed to tell a story. And a convention of good storytelling is this notion of themes. So when you think about, you know, magazines, often they'll have like these editions. Um, the, the, you know, the, the um, politics edition or whatever, choose the theme, right? And you know, similarly in video games, themes also play a really major role um, in binding the, the player to the experience and immersing them in the game. So when we thought about the dashboard, the flexible dashboard with Can Do, we really wanted to use a theme as a glue that held all the individual pieces of content together and really amplified the overall message of the theme. So when we launched the reporting hub, for example, and I keep using that because I um, think it's a good example, we changed the theme of the dashboard to really promote this feature. Um, it was the reporting hub edition. Um, yeah. 
And there was a video that provided an overview of the, the reporting hub. There were articles to help customers understand the details of how to use it. Um, and then there was also content developed by our um, uh, thought leadership team that was really about best practices in data and measurement. And together, I think that theme really amplified our overall go-to-market message around this major project product launch um, and, and really drove awareness and adoption of the reporting hub. So you're, you've got a picture up there um, of the, I think this was like the first um, experience we delivered with CanDo. We had just launched the customer education playbook. Um, and then there, I threw in a picture of there, one of the latest ones too. We just did a, a new launch with um, content. Uh, we're, we redesigned how you author content. So we had a lot of big, we wanted to, since it was re sort of redesigning a currently existing system, we really wanted to be very visual about all the different changes that you would see now in the content authoring plat, um, side of the, the plot product. So with all these like screenshots and new things that you could do, um, and of course, you, you, if you scroll, scroll down, you'd be able to see more stuff, but um, you can see sort of the evolution of, of the first one to our latest one here. <laughs> I love that. And I love that you all are willing to experiment. I think what you said about sort of themes and issues um, sort of resonates with this idea of a dynamic experience where the user kind of wants to come back and wants to see what's new because there's an expectation that the information is always changing um, versus sort of a static experience or static content that just feels like it's there, it's not really personalized and um, it doesn't really motivate people to continue coming back and learning new things because there's no expectation that it's going to change or update in some way. Yeah, definitely. So this kind of is really leads into this next question is, um, do you think static content can ever be considered an experience? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yes. I mean, what is an experience? It's, I think of an experience as a, as a perception someone has of, um, you know, of, of the experience of the content, their thoughts about it, their feelings, how it does or doesn't motivate them. So from that angle, static content is certainly an experience. It's just not necessarily a great experience. Um, you can tell a great story through a short video, for example, and put that on the admin page. But if that's, um, you know, if that's all someone sees day after day after day, week after week after week, so forth, you know, even the best content grows stale um, if we see it over and over and over again. So I would say that if customers are seeing content over and over again, that's a wasted opportunity. Um, if you have a captive audience, use that. Um, what do you want to say to them? Because they're listening. Uh, you know, if you have people signing into your product and they see, you know, the same admin page, um, there's your opportunity. What do you want to say to them? <laughs> right. Uh, and especially in now in the modern world, you know, we are all actively consuming content all the time. So I think customers are becoming, um, you know, they expect more from their favorite brands than static content. They want content that's dynamic and relevant and fresh. Um, and that's something else I learned about in designing video games, actually, this notion of replayability. Some games are a lot more fun to play again and again than others. Um, and that's because they have replayability baked into them. So there might be some randomized content or loot tables or multiplayer capabilities, something that makes playing each game feel a little different each time you play it. So when I go about designing a content experience from the ground up, I also think you know, similarly about replayability, whether it's our blog or our academy or our admin dashboard, our flexible dashboard, the challenge is really the same. You know, how do you keep this content experience fresh and dynamic and relevant so that your audience feels compelled to return? I love that. Maybe it's something like thinking through um, evergreen content and yeah. how does that experience change over time? Yeah, exactly. Um, what what else can we tell them? You know, we we try to um, use, you know, our when you sign into the academy, for example, we try to use uh, parts of our academy to um, rotate in different things that we want to highlight or promote, um, new things that we've launched. Um, you know, it's important that the experience feels like new um, and fresh. Uh, when I sign in, I want to see like the latest and greatest. I don't want to go hunting for it. Um, so 
that's, I think, really important. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's actually perfect because it leads into our next question is like, how does timely content um, impact that user engagement, um, that dynamic experience that's going to keep them coming back? Yeah, so our content strategy on the admin dashboard, which is powered by Kendu, is really all about driving engagement with our product and our, our content. So we have it set up um, so that we change the dashboard completely with each product release. So each edition really is changes like with the product releases that we do, um, usually monthly. Um, and yeah, we change the theme of all the content to usually re reflect that release cycle, something we want to promote in the product, something we want to promote in the content that we create in that cycle as well. Um, a new feature, for example, or an improvement in an existing system, or maybe a new certificate program. So we've definitely seen incredibly significant improvements in user engagement with product features that we promote on the dashboard, uh, as well as engagement with content that we highlight. And in some cases, in fact, it's, it's literally been painful for us to remove highlighted content. Um, you know, for example, in one edition that we released uh, based on our product release cycle, we launched what we call a control panel, which allowed our customers to easily learn about and toggle on extensions and integrations with our platform. And at launch, we promoted this feature on the dashboard with a theme all around powering up your learning system. And we saw a huge engagement with the control panel, this new feature, which led to incremental upsells. Um, but when we changed the theme of the dashboard to reflect the next product release and then removed as part of that, removed the promotions for the control panel, we saw a drop off in engagement. Uh, so we had to decide whether to keep promoting the control panel on the dashboard, even though the theme changed um, or, uh, or remove it. And ultimately we decided to integrate it into the overall content experience. So. Now, if you, if you were able to scroll down um, in the dashboard, there's a new section that changes with each edition, each theme. And that section is like a little bar. It says this month spotlight features where we can promote five different integrations and features that you can toggle on. Um, and there's a CTA to learn more about these features that lead to the control panel. So problem solved. Yeah, nice. And actually, I'm really interested to share that with the audience in, in our uh, future blog about this webinar. We'll include some GIFs that kind of explain that or visually explain that. Um, so that's kind of where um, the 101% increase in daily yeah. activity for your users comes in. And if you could yeah. just talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah, that's a quote that um, I think is on a, a blog on your site. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I said, in addition to promoting new product features, we, we definitely use the dashboard to promote content. And when we first launched the dashboard, we promoted our Thought Industries Academy um, pretty broadly. Um, I think there might've been a call to action to develop mastery with Thought Industries by enrolling in a course or something like that. In any case, we saw visits to our academy double almost immediately. So before we implemented CanDo, we had about 5% of our customers enrolling in courses. And after implementing CanDo about a year ago, that jumped to 30%. Um, today, over 80% of our customers who have started with Thought Industries in the last six months have engaged with our academy. So it turns out that promoting your education programs in the product is actually quite effective at driving engagement with your education programs and something that I would highly encourage everyone to do. That's great. Um, so this is, how has the ability to quickly make changes to the user interface um, helped cross-functional teams get more collaborative and creative and maybe even going back to how you work with the marketing team or how you work with other teams at Thought Industries? Yeah, we, we set up our dashboard in a, a really novel way, um, which is, I think, a testament to just how awesome our product and UX team um, teams are. Our head of UX, Alejandro, he constructed a template in the CanDo platform um, that my team, or any team really, um, it's just that my team's really responsible for it, 
um, that they could use. Um, so we don't know how to code. We don't know how to code experiences. We don't really have any um, visual designers, um, but I don't think we really needed to. You know, Alejandro made it super easy for us with these templates to just drop in a new image, swap out some text, um, change the link, and then, you know, boom, we have a new edition of the dashboard. You know, occasionally we would definitely collaborate with Alejandro or visual designers on creating new configurations or new visual assets, um, but we never ever have had to bug any developers to make any changes. Um, all of that dynamic content delivered fresh to our customers without uh, any burden to our very busy um, dev team. So this has obviously allowed us to unleash our creativity. You know, we can truly innovate, try new things, experiment, mess around with different configurations. Um, if we create a content block that isn't working very well, we can make a change to it on the fly. Uh, I think our marketing team loves being able to drive registrations for webinars or promote um, you know, blog articles or promote our cognition conference event all through our platform without having to rely entirely on traditional channels like email. Um, and I think most importantly, our customers love our dynamic dashboards with its mix of customer education and strategy and best practices. I think the dashboard really brings to life our commitment to product innovation and thought leadership. And um, yeah, I see it as an essential part of the thought industry's experience. Yeah, I love this idea too that your UX team built you this template because a lot of people might think that like if, if you're a UX designer, you might you know cringe thinking about people sort of doing their own thing within a dashboard or having no structure kind of or style guide to work off of and i like this idea that the ux team has created this sort of set it and forget it um, strategy for you all to then you know use your creativity within those bounds Exactly. And, you know, the can do dashboard builder has a lot of like WYSIWYG stuff to let you, you know, create your own. Um, but I think with us, we really wanted to, um, you know, we wanted to maintain a, a style guide, essentially a standard of, of what the design was like. So that was why our, our UX designer was like, okay, we're going to have this many content blocks. They're going to be in these locations. Um, and it's just going to be really easy for us to just like you know, pop in different uh, um, images or text to, to kind of change the whole feel of it. Nice. Well, we have about 10 minutes left here and I wanna make sure we get to some of these questions. So we may lose a few questions on our interview here at the end. So let's try and get to, we have a question from Dave. Um, what's an example of a B2B SaaS product that has brought some game design aspect that drives motivation? That's a really good question, Dave. If, if you're still on, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that as well. Um, I actually don't use a ton of B2B SaaS products that have used game design aspects to drive motivation. I certainly have used um, B2C products that have done that. And um, you know what comes to mind immediately is um, LinkedIn in terms of giving me feedback constantly on my profile and how you know, how, how good my profile is. Um, TurboTax, when I do my taxes, giving me really great sort of encouragement and like um, helping ways to sort of motivate me, to even checking in with how I'm feeling <laughs> as I'm doing my taxes. Um, so, you know, and certainly there are lots of great examples in the world of customer education as well. Um, Salesforce Trailhead, for example, I think is a gold standard in delivering a, 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 game, a gamified learning experience. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts if you have any, any thoughts about B2B SaaS products that really do a great job bringing game design into, into the, the product design. Yeah. Uh, Dave says he has one example, and then he also said plus one for Trailhead. So Dave, if there's anything other than Trailhead, we'd love to hear it. Um, and then uh, we have from Jonathan, our CEO, who's on here. Um, Gorgeous does this great as well. Um, they tell you you're onboarded and you're at a scale of zero to five based on actions you've taken within their product. I love so, that. Yeah. <clears throat> I think one of the most delightful onboarding experience I had was with the SaaS um, company 
I think it was called Mind Touch. Um, and they, they had this like visual onboarding journey that um, was very visual, it's very colorful. And um, each step of the way you could click into and it sort of was this container of all the things that you needed to do and you needed to kind of check them off. And then when you did, you know, that sort of checked off and you made your way to the next step. And so I think that's great. You, actually, as I'm talking about this, you know, I, I think a really great example is Asana, honestly. The Asana, unicorn? Yeah, because, you know, when you check off, first yeah. of all, checking things off is, is very satisfying. Um, yeah. But Asana has this um, randomized, there's a small possibility that um, when you check something off, you'll get a unicorn or a Yeti or some colorful creature flying across the screen, um, a, a magical creature. And, and that's always just a wonderful feeling when that happens. So um, I think they've done a really good job in that as well. Yeah, no, I do love that. And it does, it is delightful <laughs> when that happens for sure. Yeah. And, and Dave did respond and he said, um, the best one he's seen is Toggle. Um, you unlock badges that help Ex when you're exploring the interface naturally it's very easy and you get up to speed super quickly so nice. and that feels like game design as well it does feel yeah. like you're sort of collecting things along the way um putting them in your satchel or whatever it may definitely, be um, definitely so i love that i wish more products would do more uh would integrate more game design systems i think they would really benefit from that you know we spend so much time in these products at work um you know, would it hurt to make it a little bit more fun? <laughs> right. No, so, exactly. Actually, today's question, he wants to know what kind of game design principles that would enhance the UX of the Thought Industries platform. We've actually been considering this quite a bit. Um, so, you know, we've got all this like, um, you know, all this research we're doing, all this, you know, through my team, understanding the the practice of, of, of customer education, best practices, all this data we have with, you know, uh, thousands of learners in our platform, um, customers and what they're doing, you know, I think that we can, um, we can bring that more into the experience when, when you're creating, when you're authoring a content, for example, is there a way for us to provide feedback on how optimized that content is for completion or how, you know, based on the things you're doing, how engaging is it? And then maybe how you, how your, your um, completion rates might compare to others who are similar in similar um, industries or similar verticals. Uh, so there's a, I think, you know, that bringing sort of like that kind of feedback into the system that allows you to kind of, you know, we have a lot of people in our, in our using our system who, um, you know, just maybe don't have the kind of experience um, because a lot of us don't, to really know what is a really fantastic learning experience? How, how should I do this in a way that really is optimized for engagement? So I think the more that we can provide that feedback into the system, I think the better. And that's where I, that's one thing that I would love to see. Yeah, it kind of goes back to that, I don't know what I don't know sort of yeah. concept. And yeah, that's so true. Um, yeah, let's see if there are any other questions, we'll take them now. We may have one more time or a little bit more time for some of the interview questions we still have lined up, but um, I've loved these questions so far. Oh, actually we are at the final Q&A. Um, <laughs> Jonathan, actually, Jonathan actually mentioned um, the metaverse and I wonder you know, if we have just like a couple minutes left here, if you have any thoughts on, how that's changing, um, not just game design, but experience design and, and how, you know, how is somebody going to learn in the metaverse? Yeah. Have, have you guys thought, started thinking that through, or is that even applicable well, to I'm, what you're doing? I'm going to answer, I'll answer that for my own personal um, position. Um, and that is, well, I, I think I'm, I'm probably relatively more uh, geeky about this kind of thing than the average person. Uh, well, you know, I'll, I do... I'll tell you right off. I uh, had the SDK for the first Oculus, and also I worked at Magic Leap, which is an AR company. There you so... go. There's my Oculus <laughs> right yeah. here. <laughs> so you're talking you to the right done person. This webinar in, in virtual reality. <laughs> right. <laughs> so awesome. So you get you get it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I. 
I am so excited about the future of learning. Um, I think that one of the one of the things that actually got me into this industry in the first place was reading a sci-fi novel called The Diamond Age, um, which part of that novel is there's this um, there's this girl who has this tablet who is basically it's basically her her education it's elementary school and high school and college and it gets to really know her and understand her psychology and understand what she really needs to learn and delivers that learning to her in the perfect way that is optimized for her the way that she the what she needs to learn and how she needs to learn it and that got me really inspired about the future of learning so i just think you know when we think about the metaverse i i have thoughts about virtual reality i, I don't <laughs> Thinking about Mark Zuckerberg in that conference room, his little avatar. <laughs> I don't think I don't, I'm not sure we're going to get there, or if we do, it, yeah. it'll be a while. I'm actually a lot more excited about um, uh, augmented realities, the way that we can sort of overlay information onto our real world, and the learning implications of that. Especially if you think about the manufacturing world and how they need to learn how to operate complex machinery, for example. I think there's, um, you know, the medical world, there's a lot of really incredible opportunities there. And I also get really excited about the development of artificial intelligence and how that can really, you know, we can teach machines to better understand um, humans and their learning needs and really surface um, just-in-time learning much more effectively. So those are kind of the areas that I get uh, really excited about. Um, of course, virtual reality is always going to be fun to, you know, I, when I think about virtual reality, it's for me, I get more excited than anything about like, what can I learn about virtual reality when it becomes truly fully immersive and like super realistic, like I want to walk around, you know, the ruins uh, in, you know, some old country and learn all about maybe touch something and it pops up information about it and sort of that kind of experience I think is is gets me really excited as well. Yeah, I hear like learning by doing is kind of the theme that I'm getting and and basically you know just how we I guess it goes back to um that motivation and that real time motivation that you're getting from that that responsive sort of feedback um, where mm -hmm. it's being personalized and delivered to you um, if you're working with AR um, and you know how that translates to something that is overlaid on the current thing in front of you and it's responding to you as you manipulate it. I love that. Absolutely. Um, one of my favorite classes I've ever took in college was took place in Second Life. And I'm, I, I remember people, Second Life. <laughs> Do you remember? Okay. Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah. I'm probably um, just as nerdy as you. you okay, good. <laughs> so yeah, the very first day of class, we had to all arrive to a planet in Second Life. And um, we had to create our avatars ahead of time. And I I have this huge, this angel, this with black wings, like that I designed that I like come come descend from the skies. <laughs> Everyone else is like dressed in regular clothes. Maybe they have blue skin or something, but I like went yeah. all out. It was really funny. But anyway, the whole purpose of the course was about learning in Second Life. And our 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 final project was to create, um, we created these um, houses based on this architect's design in Second Life that were fully sustainable um, housing. And um, we invited, we had sort of a ribbon cutting. We invited all these people and they could walk through the houses and look around and like there are these little hot spots you could touch and learn about the materials we used and learn about how it's going to save you know you know environmentally friendly stuff how it's going to save money all this kind of stuff it was a really interesting experience um and obviously that was like a while ago second life i don't even know if it's around anymore but it's certainly applicable to what we think about what virtual reality will become in the future or already has become perhaps perhaps Definitely. Well, I just want to thank you for um, speaking with us today. This was just a really easy interview and it's been so fun talking to you and uh, oh, I sure. really appreciate your time and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for the great questions. Um, we also have another person, Sandra, who says she did an interview on Second Life. Hey, That's so cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you all. And thank you again, Daniel. Thanks and a lot, Ashley. Have a great day, everyone. You too.
Bye. Bye.